reading everything I possibly could from the Wall Street Journal to The Economist to Business Week to The New York Times to The Boston Globe, and I have never heard it described like this. incredible tour de forces I have ever heard in my 40 years of teaching and doing economics. So I want to thank Lynn Brown for educating every one of us. And I only wish there was some way for all the rest of the country to hear what we just heard. I knew this was going to be a spectacular evening. It's one I will never, ever forget. I want to just take a few minutes to follow up on what Lynn has done to kind of look beyond the crisis. That is, one hopes, a little bit like 1929, a little bit like 2001, a little like 1987 in October when the stock market crashed by about 25 percent, down 508 points, that somehow we will get through this. I don't think any of us know exactly how it's going to happen, and I hope after we take our break we can come back and ask, among other questions, is there a chance that this $700 billion bailout bill that is before Congress, forwarded by Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke, will actually work, and what the costs will be, and what the benefits will be. But let us just assume that somehow, having been around since at least 1787, the country weathers this somehow, and we move on, and then we have to deal with another set of problems. So what I want to do in just the next nine or ten minutes is give us a little idea of where we are, where the economy is, and with where it looks like it's trending. Um, well, pardon? Sorry. Oh, here we go. So, got it. Thanks, Chris. So here are just our real GDP growth rates from the 1960s uh, through 2007, last year. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of data here, and I want you to know that all of these data come from the Council of Economic Advisors to the United States President. So this is the official U.S. data. I didn't make any of this up. Okay? So you'll see that between the 1960s, when we had a booming economy with an average real growth and our total gross domestic product of 4.4 percent, during the 1970s, 1969 to 79, it came down to 3.2 percent, still pretty healthy. During the 80s, about 3 percent, and then during the first half of the 1990s, it fell to about 2.3 percent. The problem with an unemployment rate much below 3 percent is that when you sustain that, you cannot sustain your full employment economy. Uh, you need about 2% growth per year in order to cover for productivity growth. More output per worker means you need fewer workers. And you need about another 1% of economic growth to cover for increases in the labor force. So when we drop below about 3%, we begin to see unemployment rise. By the end of the, this period, by about 1990, a whole series of books started coming on the market, including one by Paul Krugman, who now writes for the New York Times, and a very fine economist, who argued we live in an age of diminished expectations. He looked at these bars and said, it's not surprising that we'll continue to see us coming back to Earth with growth rates of no more than 25 to 3%. Alan Blinder uh, got into a debate in the uh, magazine American Prospect with my late colleague Ben Harrison and myself as to whether there was a speed limit on the rate of growth and he suggested it might not be more than about 2.5 percent. So everybody was kind of surprised that in the second Clinton administration uh, we had over a five-year period a growth rate which was almost as great as the growth rate we had during the 1960s and indeed very close to the growth rate we had during World War II, 3.9 percent. Since that time, during the Bush W years, the growth rate has only averaged about 2.4%, not much better than that period between 1989 and 1995. 
As you might imagine, as a result, you've also seen a roller coaster in unemployment. Unemployment actually reached a peak in 7.3% in the 1980s. That was the average unemployment rate. It actually hit 10.8% in December of 1982. It then came down very strikingly between the 80s and the early 90s, and then in the second, 90, second half of the 1990s, came down to about 4.6%, again during that second Clinton uh, term. Uh, then we had George Bush, of course, this was to some extent affected by September, uh, oh, uh, September 11th, 01, uh, with unemployment rate uh, going up back to 5.2%, and then the unemployment rate that was just announced uh, for August of this year, we're back to 6.1%, which I think is the highest unemployment rate in five years. The next president is going to have to deal, therefore, with a rising unemployment rate. One of the problems that we also know is that despite what seem to be some very good economic times, hourly wages for private non-agricultural workers, these are all workers in all non-agricultural industries in the private sector, this doesn't include public sector, stopped growing in about 2003. You'll see that we had kind of a steady increase in the average hourly wage. This is in 1982 dollars, that's why they look kind of low. We're standardizing for 1982 prices. But then from 2003 on, in other words, five of the eight George W. Bush years, wages haven't risen at all, and in fact, they're the, the lowest rate since 2001. In real dollar terms, in real buying power, the typical hourly wage rate today does not buy anything more than what it bought in 2001. So we have a problem that the government is facing slow economic growth, rising unemployment, the country is facing slow economic growth, rising unemployment, and stagnating, and indeed, falling wages. We see that when we translate that into real family median household income, real median family income. Again, see the rise from 1993 to 2000. Again, this is in inflation-adjusted dollars from about $50,000 to about $60,000. But since that time, from 2001 to 2007, which happens to correspond to the two Bush presidencies, there has essentially been no growth whatsoever in median household income. In other words, the typical family in the United States, the median family, that family, situated between the poorest and the richest, today has less spending power than they had at any time since 1997. A decade ago. On the other hand, corporate profits did very well during much of the Bush administration. While corporate profits were in the neighborhood of 7 to 8% uh, before taxes uh, through 2002, Beginning in 2002, this is just after 9-11, profit rates begin to explode. And they peak at almost 14%, this is across all industries, in 2006. With the economy weakening in 2007 and then through the first six months of this year, according to President Bush's own economic advisors, profit rates are falling. But notice that even in 2008, with all of this financial crisis, profits are still approximately three to three and a half percentage points higher, or about 50% higher than they were during the period before George Bush. Chief executives have benefited from this. <laughs> this is the ratio of the annual pay, including bonuses, to all the chief executives of major traded corporations in the United States divided by the average wage of workers in the United States. Back in 1965, corporate executives on average were extraordinarily poor, earning only 25 times the annual salary of the typical worker. That remained true through 1975, and then they started finally getting the kind of income they deserved. They went from 25 to 60 times to 120. But none of them did anywhere near as well as they have done over the last eight years. And in fact, in the year they elected George Bush, they were making 300 times the average wage in the United States. It fell in 2003, corporate profits took a real hit, and then it grew again so that even by last year, as the economy is weakening, 
corporate executives, including many who run the banks that Lynn was talking about, and the investment companies, were making about 275 times the average wage of workers. Not surprising that during the negotiations with the Congress, Congressman Barney Frank and others are saying part of the bailout has to deal with executive compensation and putting some caps on that. If you look at the value of new residential housing construction, you begin to see the other reason why housing is so critical to the economy. One reason is because when you have lots of foreclosures and you have them so leveraged through the securitizations that Lynn talked about, you begin to see a weakening credit market. But the other thing is, is that obviously housing is a big industry. It contributes a huge amount of income and employment in the economy. And so you can see this housing boom from the late 1990s through 2005 with virtually a doubling in housing construction. And then it plummets. $481 billion in 2005 to less than half of that estimated through, that's extrapolated for the rest of this year through 2008. So housing turns out to be critical in understanding how the economy works. If you can understand housing finance and you can understand housing construction, you've got two giant chunks of understanding of what's going on in the economy. You also can take a look at the balance of trade. The balance of trade is how much do we export versus how much do we import. And what you've seen has been a constant decline through 2006, or constant increase in the trade imbalance. That is, we imported almost $800 billion more in goods and services in 2006 than we exported. But with the weakening dollar making it more expensive to import and cheaper to export, uh, that trade deficit has been reined in a tiny bit. So the value of the dollar is going to be really important. Because if the dollar remains cheap, right, um, then we're going to have a lot of imports. If the dollar becomes more and more expensive, right, then we may see a re some resurgence in manufacturing. We're already seeing it here in Massachusetts. I gave a major speech on that earlier today. We've been talking about federal deficits here. And last week, or two weeks ago, um, Bob was telling us a little bit about federal deficits. We were, um, we were fortunate to have Kathy Minahan, the former uh, president and CEO of the Fed. And we had kind of a little debate, how important is the federal debt? Well, I thought I'd take a look at these numbers for you. And you'll see that during the last part of the Reagan, uh, Reagan the Clinton administration, we actually ran budget surpluses. Those are the blue lines. Beginning after 9-11, you saw us having uh, growing federal deficits, um, which begin with a $158 billion deficit in 2002. Not surprising, actually. But what is surprising is when you double that to, uh, more than double that to $378 billion in 2003, $413 billion deficit in 2004, much of it, or a good part of it, for the Iraq War, you begin to see how bad the deficit can get. And then again, we had some improvement because of some strength in the economy. And then look at what happens. 2009, the Council of Economic Advisors estimate an all-time record of close to 500 billion or a half a trillion dollars. But as Bob Culver says, hey, what's a half a trillion dollars among friends? One of the questions, though, that was raised, Kathy Minahan raised it, is what you really shouldn't be so much concerned about is what is the size of the debt versus the debt-to-GDP ratio. I mean, after all, if you have a little bit of debt, but you have a lot of income, who cares, right, unless it's highly leveraged. But if your debt is rising and your income is slowing, that debt becomes more and more of a burden. So you'll see that between 1970 and 1980, we actually reduced the federal debt as a percentage of GDP to only about one-third. That is, the entire federal debt accumulated from 1787 to 1980 only was equal to about one-third of a year's output. 
By 1992, after two Reagan administrations with tax cuts and greater defense spending, followed by the George Bush, the first administration, we doubled the size of the debt to GDP ratio in just 12 years. Or as I put it, I think last week or the week before, it took us from 1787 to the year uh, 2000 to accumulate the first trillion dollars of federal debt. We quadrupled that in the next 12 years. Under Bill Clinton, liberal spending Democrat, we actually cut the debt to GDP ratio to about 58%. And then under George W. Bush, by 2009, fiscal 2009, this year we're in fiscal 2009, it's, it's up to 69%. And the, not me, not me, the Council of Economic Advisors estimate a debt of maybe 75%, um, taking into account at least a share of the additional <coughs> $700 billion that will be added on top of the 2009 debt to cover these costs. To go from a third of a year to three quarters of a year of total output uh, is quite a bit. What that means is that we'll end up with a uh, federal debt of about 11.5 to 11.6 trillion dollars by next fiscal year. And we just did a quick calculation that that works out to about $154,000 of debt per American family of four. $154,000. That's your share. Okay? Well, finally, before we take a little break and then come back for questions, let's take a look at how we're spending our money. During the late 1990s, we were spending about 15% of total federal receipts. That's how much money was generated by taxes and fees and other things. About 15% on national defense. Under George Bush, beginning in 2002, it skyrockets to about 24% of total receipts. So when you paid your taxes, about one out of every four dollar you paid went to defense, and a large share of that went to your share of paying the Iraq war. Came down a little bit um, to about 20%, 21.5%, and now the Council of Economic Advisors say it will hit a new record of about 26%. And we're starting to get back to numbers that look a little bit like Vietnam and a little bit like Korea. Uh, as you may know, there are some estimates by uh, Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, that in the end, the Iraq war will cost us about $1.3 trillion. Those numbers used to freak us out, but of course, after the last two weeks, who's swiveling? <laughs> if you look at federal priorities, you begin to see how the priorities have changed. And again, this is going to be a major problem for the next president. If you look at Social Security and you compare how much we spent in 2009, this current year, versus 1998, we are now spending about 1.7 times as much today as we spent in 1998 on Social Security, about 1.8 times as much as we spent on Income Security, which includes anti-poverty programs and things like that, about 2.3 times as much on Health, but 2.5 times as much today as 1998 in defense, and three times as much on other forms of international affairs. So even with the explosion in healthcare costs that we all hear about, and the possible impossibility of dealing with this, which we're going to discuss next week this time, we actually increased our national defense spending and international affairs spending even faster. Now why is that a serious problem? Lynn suggested to us we have a serious problem because of all of this leveraging, and after the break, we're going to have to ask some questions about can it be fixed. But the real serious problem about running such huge federal debt deficits and building up such deficit is that it begins to put a crimp in your ability to spend money on other things. You're spending a lot of money on defense, you're spending a lot of money on interest charges, and so forth. So what aren't you spending money on? Well, next semester, when Kathy Minahan and I offer a course called Economic Growth and Social Justice, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the whole question 
of how did the American economy begin to grow so fast in the 1990s. And to give you a preview of coming attractions, it had a lot to do with massive investments in infrastructure and technology during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, much of it after Sputnik. And you see this here, that in the mid of the 1960s, we were spending over 2% of GDP on basic research. This is the federal government funding basic research. It is what gave us the moon rocket program, the space program, but it also gave us all kinds of research into energy, health, and so forth. During the 1970s, that declines rather sharply. It continues to decline during the 1990s. And in fact, during the, the current uh, decade, it's risen only very slowly. So today, we're spending less than half as a percentage of GDP on all research and development by the federal government compared to what we were doing in the 60s. What that means today is not that important. Universities don't have as much money to spend. But if in fact it means that we're not getting the innovations and discoveries we need for another round of rapid growth, we're in trouble. Here are the numbers for general science. That's been wiped out from eight tenths of one percent of GDP to one tenth of GDP. Research for national defense, way down, way up during the Reagan administration. We're trying to build a missile defense shield, which, by the way, we're continuing to build with this $60 billion program in Alaska. <laughs> and we started to build up for defense research again uh, under the new Bush administration. How about energy? Well, we have an energy crisis that strikes in 1973, gas lines and all that. We begin to spend a lot of money to try and figure out how we can become less dependent on foreign oil. And then, when the crisis seems to subside a little bit, our investments in energy R&D just plummet. So from about 14 hundredths of 1% down to essentially less than 0.02%. What about transportation R&D? Same picture. The only place where we've seen a significant increase in our expenditures on research and development has to do with medical research and health research. And even then, if you look at the y-axis, we're spending now about a quarter of 1% of GDP on health research. Of course, that's for minor things like, let's say, trying to defeat cancer. So that is the kind of economy we face. And it's the economy that the next president of the United States is going to have to face. He will face a massive financial crisis that I don't think will be solved by January 20th. But beyond that, you're then going to have to figure out how do you rebuild the American economy when the last president doubled the national debt and essentially used up all the money. Thank you. Let's take about a five-minute break.